Some time ago, I turned 40 years old. What do some guys do when they turn 40? Well, they buy a Harley Davidson, find a young chick to stick on the back. I wanted to do it differently. So what I did was I sold everything. I packed everything that I owned, my family owned, into a suitcase or three suitcases and traveled the world for three years. It was like a huge detox of all the junk that you build up over life. Why? Well, why not? That's my story. There's another story out there which people pick up on and learn from, and that's the story about go to school, work hard, get good grades, get a good job, work hard, get promoted, get a car, get a house, work hard, get promoted, get a bigger car, bigger house. You only end up spinning the hamster wheel faster. That's a story that the mainstream media tells us, and I wanted to do it differently. So. For three years, we snorkeled the pristine coral reefs of Fiji. We sought out new adventures in the wild, abundant nature of New Zealand. We hung out in California with surf dudes, Florida, Cyprus, hung out in Lanzarote and the Canary Islands off the west coast of Africa, just so I could fulfill a life dream of doing the Ironman Triathlon, lived on the subtropical island of Okinawa in the East China Sea. Life's an adventure. Why not do it? So. Maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you don't want to travel the world for three years. But if you build your business right, you can have choice. Maybe you can take some time out. Maybe you can travel for six weeks, six months, six years, whatever you want. Maybe you can start another business. The choice is yours. You don't have to follow a story that somebody else has written. And that's what it's about. Life is a story. If you want a better life, all you need to do is tell a better story. Hi, my name is Graham Brown and I'm an entrepreneur investor, startup advisor, and radio show host. And it's absolutely one thing I love more than anything else, that's helping entrepreneurs like you grow your businesses, because that's my passion. You know, I exited a business a few years ago and traveled the world for three years with my family. That's a, a mini retirement, as it's called. Absolutely fantastic, a, an amazing experience, you know, all different kinds of parts of the world that we travel to, you know, to show my family the world, educate them about, you know, the bigger picture of what's out there from, you know, the coral reefs of Fiji to the beautiful nature of New Zealand to the surf cultures of Hawaii and California and so on. Absolutely loved it. But, you know, there's one thing I love more than travel and sitting on a tropical beach somewhere. It's working in a business, working on a business with entrepreneurs because, you know, I think that I believe I should say that there's no greater adventure in life than living life on your own terms. And there's nothing more rewarding than seeing somebody leave one narrative about their life and start writing their own life story, start their own business and to go through that journey to overcome the challenges. And, you know, as a result of that, become a stronger person. That's absolutely my passion, and it's an adventure that I love sharing with other people, whether that's through advising startups or through my course or through my mastermind where I, I gather together people, like-minded entrepreneurs to help each other grow their businesses or through the startup events that I organize or through the radio show where I get to interview inspiring entrepreneurs and share their journeys with people just like you. So I believe business is an adventure and it's an adventure that I'd like to invite you to join me on. It's an adventure that never goes in a straight line. It always a bit up, a bit down, but that's how adventures are. But as a result, you always become a stronger. I read this book when I was a kid called A Thousand Santas or something like that. It told the story of how, on Christmas Eve, a thousand men set out to work in Santa costumes around town from department stores to schools. When all the hard work was done, they went home and changed back into their civilian clothes. The local kids loved their Santas. The illusion was complete. They didn't know any different. Santa was a cuddly old man who, despite the apparent inconsistencies, could squeeze down chimney stacks and be everywhere at any time. I was six years old, I think. I told my friend at school about the book. I told him that Santa wasn't real. Rather, he was a guy, or one of a thousand guys, dressed up in costume. It was his job. Everything we'd been told about Santas by parents, teachers, and the TV was a lie. Not thinking much about this world-shattering revelation, I said goodbye to my friend at the school gates and walked home. The next day, his angry mother stormed into school, fuming at the teacher. 
I tried to hide behind the classroom bookshelf, but she saw me. Her eyes widened. She pointed at me, cowering in the corner of the room, and boomed, Are you the boy who told my son Santa doesn't exist? Modern success is a bit like Santa. If you're a good kid and ask nicely, Santa will reward you. If you break the rules, you won't get any presents. And be prepared for angry people who feel threatened by your existence. Well, I broke the rules. I enjoyed a few presents along the way too, however. Presents like creative and financial freedom. Freedom to do what I want, when I want. To be happy. To own my own time. To not worry about money, promotions, quarterly reviews, long commutes, losing my job, pensions, company reorgs, memos, office politics and Monday morning. Sweeter still, I didn't need to ask anyone's permission for those presents. Rather than a steady, secure life, I opted for the path less taken. I built up all my worldly middle-class trappings of success and then disposed of them all, just because I could. Just because I wanted to remember what the story was that really got me excited. Sometimes the only thing that's real is pain. It's the pain I feel when suffering a bike climb in the French Alps. These are some of the toughest cycling roads in the world, with stunning views to boot. You're suffering, but your whole body is alive with emotion. I found this to be the opposite of the numb, comfortable, middle-class existence we too readily accept as our default life plan. Sometimes it's enjoying time with my family. Even something as simple as finding a new noodle restaurant in Tokyo, the rest really doesn't matter. Perhaps I became suspicious of adults and the stories they told when I learned about those Santas. I didn't believe in the success that my parents or teachers taught me, you know, study hard, get a good job, work hard, play by the rules, buy a house, start a family, get promoted, buy a bigger house, get promoted, buy a bigger car and so on. This is what it means to be successful today. Secure, comfortable and ultimately boring. I had money, but no car or house. I rented both. People thought I was crazy. They didn't get it. They'd get it if I talked about extending the house at the weekend or test driving a new Mercedes. Yep, that would fit in. But to me, that isn't success. That's a prison sentence. Both the big house and the car are nothing more than drains on our time and money. We become slaves to other people's agendas and less happier than our younger selves. Mainstream success, you see, is a story that we believe in. It's about living your life according to other people's agendas. Like the Santas, it's a comfortable lie we tell to keep us all playing along with the game. But you can stop believing the day you start writing your own rules. Redefine success on your own terms. Real success is fill the blanks. So to become a successful entrepreneur, you need to answer four questions successfully. And those four questions are, one, why are you in business? Why this business? Why you? Who is your customer? What keeps them up at night? What are their pain points? What idea will you turn into a product? And how to launch that business for very little money and time? So let's review those four questions again. One, why are you in business? Two, who is your customer? Three, what idea will you turn into a product? And four, how to launch the business with the minimum amount of time and money. Now, if you can answer those four questions successfully, you can build a business that will make you financially free and give you plenty of choice in your life. It's not rocket science. You only have to focus on answering those four questions. And the good news is, as I said earlier, success leaves tracks. So there are plenty of examples that you can follow to answer those four questions successfully. So welcome back to the next step where we're going to talk about developing your idea or importantly, finding an idea and developing it, an idea that customers are going to love. So the idea is the starting point of your business. And although it's 
important, it's the not the most valuable part of your business. That's why it's better to start with a half-baked idea and improve it with feedback than to wait until you get the best idea possible. So if you've only got kind of half an idea, start with that. That is enough to get started on the journey rather than waiting for the perfect idea to pop into your head or for some kind of inspiration that you think is going to change the world. Chances are you're going to change your idea anyway. The most important part of your business, as we've talked about already, is execution. So don't get stuck on the idea. Sure, ideas are important, but execution, sorry, is going to change everything anyway. So at this starting point, you want to focus on the ideas that are going to work for you. To some extent, your idea should be a reflection of your skills and capabilities, and we talk about what that means in a minute and it also should depend on your insights and access to certain markets and we'll talk about that as well so step one is shortlisting your ideas remember that lean canvas there's that box one a small box for your idea or ideas that's where we're going to write a few notes over this lesson so get that lean canvas ready pen and paper ready so you can write something in stop throwing down some ideas into that box. It doesn't need to be proper working sentences, just anything. Get moving. Start pedaling the bicycle. Get on the saddle. So much easier doing it that way than trying to get the perfect answer. What we'll do is we'll prioritize a list, a short list of ideas in a small amount of time, and we'll prioritize that over spending a lot of time trying to find the right idea, execution, hustle. What do you need to be successful in a startup? Those three things. Idea, execution, hustle. You don't need money. You don't need a business plan. You don't need an office. You don't need staff. You just need an idea. Be able to execute that idea and a bit of hustle. Now, many entrepreneurs will tell you it's all about execution and little about ideas, but ideas are the base of your business. So when writing the Lean Canvas, we will focus on ideas and getting the fundamentals right. That said... Too many entrepreneurs spend too much time at the idea stage. Even if you're not ready, start executing, start shipping. Now, execution is about getting to the market fast and effectively. Often, this is a compromise, fast or effective. But in startup terms, the sooner you execute, the better you become at it. Therefore, rather than thinking about fast or effective, rather than thinking about doing it now or doing it later on and having a better product or a more finished idea is better to do it now because the sooner you do it, the better you can make that product, the more effective you can become. Hustle means spending your time on the things that will bring you customers. In many cases, hustle means getting out there. So hustle could mean writing 250 blog posts in a year Whatever it is, customers won't come to you if you build a solution. You've got to hustle. You've got to get out there and find people. Peter Thiel, the legendary investor and entrepreneur, the man behind PayPal, amongst other things, in his book, Zero to One, makes a really important point for us entrepreneurs when thinking about our idea. And this is this. Don't bet on developing a market. In the 1990s, everybody talked about first mover advantage. It was very big back in the dot-com days. And companies like Amazon proved that being the first had a huge impact, a compound impact on their branding, trust, and awareness. So everybody thought that you've got to be the first mover to make things work. And that kind of wisdom still persists today. People think that You've got to get first into a market to dominate that market and be fast. And that makes some people a little bit wary, a little bit bored of working with existing markets. You know, when you say you've got an idea, if somebody says, oh, well, so-and-so has already done that, don't ever take that as a reason why you should stop. And here's the reason why Google wasn't the first, was it? I'm sure you use Google as your main search engine. But if you went back a few years, there was Lycos, AltaVista, Hotbot, Excite, and many others that came before that. Remember Yahoo? Well, that was years ahead of Google, right? Yahoo was one of the first movers. But Google now completely dominates that market. 
It's much better to be the last mover for a number of reasons. First movers have to make big bets on developing a market. They spend millions on educating customers, on developing business models, and testing unproven concepts. Yahoo is a good example. Google sat and watched from the sidelines and built their solution based on what wasn't working with all the other guys. It's very unlikely that if there wasn't a Yahoo, Lycos, AltaVista, Hotbot, Excite, and all those guys that came before them, there wouldn't have been a Google. But those guys went out there, spent millions on developing their market. And those millions came from investors, everybody that bought into those companies because, you know, they were excited about these first movers. But effectively, what they did was all of those investors who invested in these companies effectively did the market research for Google. So Google went in there with all this knowledge of what wasn't working and then built their own solution. So what does this mean for you in terms of developing your ideas? Well, you might not be the next Google, but there's an important point here about whether or not you should consider an idea because somebody else has done it. In so many examples, the most profitable businesses out there are based on ideas which other people have had. So my point is that you don't have to have a completely original idea. It's so often heard that these days when you come up with an idea, somebody says, well, that's not original. There's never a reason you should give up on something. It's better to focus on an idea somebody else has proven works and then out execute, i.e. do a better job of it. Because I am guarantee to you that whatever ideas exist out there is running businesses in the market today, you could do a better job somehow. You might not be able to be bigger, you might not be faster, but there might be a specific niche that they're not targeting or a specific angle or a specific part of the service they're not providing that you can go in because you're smaller and more nimble and do a better job, right? So very dangerous to go in and try and build a market which people aren't used to. You need a lot of money and a lot of time and it's a big risk. Focus on what works already and do a better job. So what we're going to do in the next few steps is do exactly that. Find out what works already with your idea and can we improve on that? And there's a science behind this. And we'll talk about how you can do that by going in and using the tools online, looking for what ideas work and then looking for what's not working and what's broken with the current executions. In the seven day startup, Dan Norris asks, what are people already paying for? So rather than looking at the response to your idea, look at where people are paying money for a solution. If you're a Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk, then you can do that big visionary thing. And the reason is, is because whatever you decide to do, you can get access to hundreds of millions of dollars. Doors will open for you everywhere. Resources won't be a problem. For everybody else, however, it's far less risk to focus on what already works. So if you tell an investor today that you don't have competition, you're also telling them that there isn't a market for your product. Focus on where there is competition already. That sounds completely contradictory to traditional business advice. And let me tell you why. Because traditional business advice was built in an era where it cost a lot of money to start businesses. Therefore, if you wanted to be successful, you had to be big. And to be big and successful, you needed new markets to accommodate these big companies, right? So everything kind of was built around this fact that these Startups were expensive and your business would have cost a lot of time and money. So if it's going to work, you make sure you have a unique idea. Today, however, you don't need to do that. Look at where the money already is. It's easy enough to go into Google Keywords tool and search for terms related to your product. And we'll talk about how you can do this in a minute. Terms with high bids. So let's say you went in there and you went for pet grooming. You know, you'll find that There already may be a lot of competition for Google keyword searches from other people. So effectively what people are doing is every time somebody types in pet grooming, there is a competitor who is bidding to be in those search results. Is that sort of the right-hand side search result that you get showing the Google AdWords results. So you might look at that and think, well, the competition here is pretty tough. 
And maybe there are high bids, you know, people are paying a lot of money, which is off putting for you because you think, well, I can't go in there and advertise because I don't have that kind of budget. But think again, because what that's saying is people, some people out there, some companies out there know there is a market for this stuff, right? And they're willing to pay money for it. They've already done the market research for you. They've already done a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And you can then use that as a sign that there is a market and there are customers who are already paying for some kind of product relating to pet grooming already, right? So if you don't find any kind of interest or any kind of bids for your searches, that's a warning sign. It's not necessarily a gap in the market that presents you an opportunity. It's more of a warning sign that shows that nobody has yet found this market. Okay, if you're Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, great. But for everybody else, be aware. You know, instead of trying to create a new market, it's better to focus on an existing one where you can do a better job than the current providers. Richard Branson famously did this with his airline when he launched Virgin Airlines. He basically looked around, saw what was broken, what didn't work, and did a better job. He didn't invent air travel. He just out-executed the cumbersome operators who were doing a very poor job of it. Similarly, don't be afraid of playing in a market that's already developed. You know, be afraid of playing in one that you have to risk your time and money developing yourself. So when it comes to formulating your idea, ask yourself this question, does there exist a market for this idea already? Are people already paying for it? If not, that's a warning sign. Maybe you need to tweak it a little bit and find something aligned to that where people are paying for goods and services. And there is proof. There are keyword searches that say that. So let's talk about how we can actually do this and some of the tools that we can use to actually determine whether or not there's a market and what kind of pain points out there exist already. Hi, let's talk about the right mindset to be an entrepreneur. And probably one of the things that you've heard about and you've been indoctrinated with, so to speak, is this myth of never give up. And us entrepreneurs starting out, we often hear this, that a mix of follow your passion plus never give up is the secret formula to success. And we believe this because we see it everywhere. It's replicated in every piece of cultural media out there. And we believe that every successful entrepreneur has that mix of following their passion and never giving up. And what I want to share with you now is that belief is perhaps one of the strongest beliefs that hold us back in business. That we believe that simply having something we're passionate about and being so pig-headed that we never give up and we never quit, that we will follow through and be successful. Because we hear it all the time. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. And if you quit, it's almost like you're a failure in yourself, right? There's a bit of a macho attitude towards business there. But what I want to share with you today is that actually winners quit. Winners quit all the time. It's losers that aren't able to quit. Losers aren't able to quit because they're too scared of what other people might think of them. So let's talk about this whole idea of never give up. Now, I understand what to never give up means. I did an Ironman triathlon. And if you're new to Ironman triathlon, let me just tell you what it is. It's a, a 4K swim, 180K bike, and a marathon, right? You can't go into that race with the attitude of, never, of giving up easily, right? You can't go into that race thinking, you know, I might just sit down here or I might just stop and, you know, have some food at the feed station, right? You can't do that. You've got to do the Ironman triathlon. You've got to do it with the attitude of never give up, right? So yes, I have that attitude, but I have that attitude when it comes to sport, when it comes to hobbies, because there's a big difference between Ironman triathlon and business. And there is a big difference, but the media kind of blurs that because we kind of get all these analogies of sport applied to business, about teamwork, being a team player, having a goal. You know, all that kind of makes sense, but then there's this thing about never giving up. You know, every successful sports champion or team never gave up, and that is very true. They stuck it out to the last minute, and that last minute may have been the minute where they got the goal or they shoot the hoop or whatever. 
So yes, it works in sport, but to be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to understand that's where it ends. When it comes to becoming a successful entrepreneur, you've got to be able to give up when you need to give up. So let me just share with you what that successful mindset is. You see, the thing about all these stories of successful people who worked hard and never gave up is this thing called survivor bias. Let me explain what that means. Is that for every one story you hear about a Mark Zuckerberg who worked really hard and was passionate about what they did, there are 10,000, maybe 100,000 or a million stories of people who did exactly the same and failed. But the media doesn't talk about them. Who wants to know about the guy who was passionate about his business and worked really hard and all hours that he had available to him and failed in the first year? Nobody wants to know about that story, right? But that's the problem is that this survivor bias shows us an image of what entrepreneurs are, but it doesn't show us the image of what happens behind the scenes. And the reason why people are successful and this is what I want to teach you in this course, is not because they were passionate and they never give up. And that is an easy route to follow and one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs can make, thinking that is just the only thing that you need to be successful. And so many people do that and end up unsuccessful and they wonder why. The key to being successful is to be able to test and to validate. And what I mean by that is to get into the game fast, to launch fast, to know what your customers want fast, to launch cheaply and to get to the market cheaply. So to validate and test your ideas and your business is key because every successful entrepreneur out there has at some point gone through this process and this is what I want to teach you in this course. Sure, you need to be passionate and you need to not give up, never give up. These make sense, but that isn't the formula. That just gets you started. That gets you into the game. Winning the game is understanding how to test and how to validate your ideas and your products. So, let's go on. That's what we're gonna learn next in this course. Yeah, and then I want to talk about goals. I want to talk about goals because goals are really important. And there's a whole section on goals in my entrepreneur upgrade course on Upschool. So I want to talk about goals. And one of the things I talk about in the course is about whether or not your goals are big enough. So one of the things I think we tend to do as entrepreneurs is when we set goals is we set goals that don't stretch us and what i mean by that is goals which don't mean we have to dig deep and mean we don't have to become better people to achieve them because here's the thing you know the whole point of achieving a goal is not necessarily the achievement itself it's what you become in the process so the reason you set the goal is not the getting of the goal, but the journey, because it's the journey that makes you grow as an individual. So for example, one of the scary goals that I set for myself a while back was to complete the Ironman triathlon. An Ironman triathlon is a more or less a 4,000 meter swim, 180k bike and a marathon. And you know, looking at it on paper, it's pretty damn scary, especially if you haven't done anything like that before. So the reason I set that is because I would have to dig deep and become a better person to achieve that goal. And that's why you set the goal. I mean, actually collecting the medal, as you can see evidenced on my wall up there, actually collecting the medal is, is less important than the journey itself, is less important than what I became, what I learned, what I, the skills I had to take on board in achieving that goal. So for you lifestyle entrepreneurs today, my message is this, is are your goals big enough? And one of the ways you can test your goals to see if they're big enough is when you think about them, do they scare you? Because if they don't scare you, they're not big enough. You know, when you think about your goal, do you think, shit, am I going to be able to do this? Do you sort of get a sense of anticipation, a sense of Fear creep into your 
belly when you think about your goals because if you do you're doing the right thing you know if you just look at your goal and think ah well you know i get that then it ain't gonna stretch you it ain't gonna be worth dedicating your year to achieving that goal so one of the things i set for myself this year and i've shared it here on this 365 day challenge is my goal of taking a new business from zero to a hundred thousand in sales and sharing that journey with you in the public eye you know, going from zero to 100,000 in sales isn't that scary, but sharing it with everybody is scary. And I think about it sometimes and I think, well, should I have done that? And then you get this sort of voice in doubt, voice of doubt that creeps into your mind and it says things like, well, you know, maybe, you know, you'll find a way out of it. Or maybe if it doesn't work out, you can come up with some bullshit excuse as to why it didn't happen. Because that's the voice of doubt. That's the easy way out right? And that will never make me grow as an individual. But putting myself out there, putting myself on the line, sharing that journey with you, and for you to see it is pretty damn scary because, you know, everything I do is out there in the public. Every failure I make is made public. You can see everything that I do. And, you know, as this sort of grows, as the, as the business starts growing, I will be able to share more and more case study experience from it, you know, I'll, in the next few days, I'll be able to share some, you know, test results that I've been doing in my marketing and so on, what's worked, what hasn't worked and so on. Right now, it's still too early days to share anything. But, you know, when I do start sharing and start sharing my sales figures, my marketing figures, you know, how I'm doing my marketing and so on, you'll be able to see everything. And that's pretty damn scary because, you know, we lifestyle entrepreneurs pride ourselves in being able to you know, be kings of our own castle, we don't have to answer to anybody, you know, we don't have a boss, we don't have a team, you know, we just do the hell what we like. And that's a good thing. But it's also a bad thing in a way, because we don't become accountable, we don't have anybody to kick our ass, right. So one of the reasons I set this goal is specifically because of my lifestyle entrepreneur, is that I don't have anybody to kick my ass, you know, if I don't achieve this goal, well, so what, you know, what's going to happen. But if I don't achieve this goal, and this goal is public, you know, I feel my reputation is at stake, right? So for me, that's pretty damn scary because I value the reputation far more than achieving 100,000 in sales, right? Because, you know, my integrity as an entrepreneur is something I've built over 20 years of being in business, right? So if it doesn't scare you, is it big enough? So go back to your goals, whatever goals that you've set for yourself, you know, do you feel the butterflies in your stomach when you think about your goals, right? Because, you know, here's the thing. We lifestyle entrepreneurs, we pretty much can do what the hell we like with our lives. We've got complete control over our lives, right? We've got a, you know, in many ways, it's a blank slate. If you're a, a freelance uh, a freelance or an employee, you know, you're pretty much controlled by whoever pays your bills. If you're a startup founder, you often have to answer to a team or you have to answer to investors or people that you borrow money from. But of a lifestyle entrepreneur, we don't answer to anybody apart from ourselves. That is why it's so much more important for us lifestyle entrepreneurs to set bigger goals than it would be for anybody else. Because for you know that reason, we have the blankest of all canvases to play from. You know, if you were a startup entrepreneur, a lot of your growth is mapped out for you. If you are a freelancer or an employee, it's all mapped out for, for you. But as a lifestyle entrepreneur, nothing's mapped out for you. So we have to get really good at goal setting. And there's a whole section, as I say, in my entrepreneur upgrade, if you want to understand about goal setting, how to do it, how to review goals, what makes a good goal, what makes a bad goal, techniques, hacks, tools to set your goals. For now, I want to leave you with that thought. Are your goals big enough? What do you think? You know, this is an opportunity to make 2017 the best year yet. What kind of goals have you set for yourself? We'd love to hear from you, lifestyle entrepreneurs out there, what you've set for yourself this year. You can hit me up in the usual way. If you're responding by email, hit me an email or you respond by chat. Do you think that the goals you set for yourself are big enough? Why all your assumptions are going to be wrong. If you're in business, one thing you've got to get used to is change. And one of the key factors of change is that 
everything you assume about your business is going to be wrong. It's going to turn out very different to how you imagined it. People are going to buy it in a different way. The product's going to look different. You're going to have to change it many, many times. So this is core to the process. It's not a bad thing. It's about building a business around the idea that assumptions are going to be wrong. It's called failure. So I want to start by referring back to uh, the book Seven Day Startup by Dan Norris and talk about why assumptions are going to be wrong and what we can do about it. So if you remember, our number one goal and only goal is to find a paying customer. Until you have that paying customer, don't assume anything. So let's say you did some very casual research and you talked to people that could have been in the pub, it could have been at work, it could have been around the water cooler. And somebody said that the product was great or your idea was great. Well, if you assume you can build a business around that, you're going to be wrong. If you assume that people will buy your product because they said so and you surveyed them, you're going to be wrong again. Assumptions rarely match the real world behavior of customers in the wild. It goes back to the experience I talked about, learning Japanese or riding a bike. You can't do this without actually doing this. That's because you, you've got to be very careful how you validate your assumptions. Now, there's a popular movement called the Lean Startup Movement, which will draw a lot of information and insights for to help you achieve this four-week launch in this course. But we've got to kind of take it with a pinch of salt as well, because the Lean Startup Movement popularizes the idea that you can test a product. Keep testing, testing, testing some ideas before you go and launch. So the problem with this, this approach is that if you keep testing an idea or a product without people able to buy that product, a lot of the data that you're getting feedback on is often invalid. Now, Dan Norris says that it, it works if your validation is an obvious yes, no decision. But too many entrepreneurs get this part wrong. For example, if you get people signing up to an email newsletter, that is not a yes, no decision about your product. That is not an indication that people will buy your product or service. If you get people to opt into a beta test, again, that is not a yes, no decision about your product. And especially if people say, yeah, that's a great idea. That is not a yes, no decision about your product. And Dan Norris provides two examples in his book, which emphasizes how pre-shipping assumptions can be very dangerous. Here's one example. It's a great business, said startup veteran Jason Calacanis in response to Dan's informally beta test. But after receiving his login, Jason Calacanis, who said it was a great business, never logged in. Thanks for helping us solve a problem most face every day. Great work, man. I recommend this product to quite a few people. That was an email from a beta tester who never became a paid customer. So the reality is, in the wild, the customer is a different animal. Assume nothing. Steve Jobs famously said that people don't know what they want. But Darren Norris adds, and I completely agree with this point, people don't know what they want until they are forced to open up their wallets. That means any kind of testing, any kind of validation that could be sort of product testing or focus groups or surveys or whatever, it's really indicative of what people want unless it involves real product and real money. And that's called shipping. So rather than focus on pre-selling and pre-launching and pre-testing, just launch. Don't be the guy that keeps having a conversation about the app you're going to launch. If you're an entrepreneur, launch. Be the guy having a conversation with a paying customer. So the goal of this course is to get you to that point within four weeks. You know, rather than talking about pre-launching and pre-testing and research, the best way to do this is to launch and correct our mistakes as we go on. I want to talk about the importance of going small. And to do this, I want to share with you the insights from the book, The One Thing by Keller. And it basically asks this question, if everyone has the same amount of hours in the day, why are their results so very different? How do some people earn much more, achieve more, end up having more, create more ideas than others in the same amount of time? And the answer lies in getting to what Keller calls the heart of things. And they do this by going small. 
Contrary to the wisdom of go big or go home, Keller argues that if you want the best chance of success for your idea, you need to go small. So what does going small really mean? Well, it means ignoring the distractions and narrowing your focus. You only have so much time and energy, so how do you choose to allocate that? 30 years ago, if you were into woodworking, you'd open a store or a magazine and sell to enthusiasts that way. You'd, your idea would be create a woodworking fanzine or a woodworking store, and it would work because there wouldn't be so much competition. Today, however, there's a guy out there who's passionate about woodworking and dedicating his life to it. How are you going to compete with him? Giving it one day a week isn't going to help. So for the battle of attention, specialists beat generalists every time. Generalists juggle too many balls or try to juggle too many balls. And they work longer hours because they're running many projects and their ideas are not focused enough. It's a stressful experience. They end up saying stuff like, how can I get by with just three hours of sleep a night? Going small means staring at one thing. So in preparation for your ideas, it's better to go smaller and focus on one niche idea than trying to focus on one big game changer. Financial freedom means paying off the mortgage. What complete middle class BS. It seems we've built a system where everyone is trying their hardest to pay off their mortgage loans and be financially free. But that's not financial freedom. In fact, the most effective way to find financial freedom isn't to be debt free, but to know how to use debt to your advantage. Let me explain. Financial freedom means if... I decide to never work again, I won't need to worry about paying the bills. Sure, I might not be able to afford that 250 foot yacht, but everything else is taken care of. That's what freedom is. As I'll explain in this ebook, financial freedom often means taking on debt, good debt. Good debt means someone else is paying for it and you're making a profit. Owning real estate is a good example of this. Bad debt, by contrast, is the debt you have to pay interest on. Examples include borrowing money to buy a car, extending your house, or going to university even. This is debt that you have to pay off that's growing every day and isn't working for you. So to clarify, good debt is money you borrow that someone else is paying the interest on. Bad debt is money you borrow that you pay the interest on. Good debt creates financial freedom. Bad debt creates financial slavery. Unfortunately, the standard middle class narrative of success promotes bad debt. Rather than grow a real estate portfolio, for example, we are encouraged to extend our houses or buy new cars. If you borrow money to buy a car, I'm sorry, but you're an idiot. Financially speaking, an idiot. You're a good guy, really, because you're reading this book. Wait, I'm a hypocrite. I did that once too. I'm an idiot. Many years ago, I was an idiot. Like most young kids, I wanted a car to impress others and show them I was successful, going places. So I borrowed money to buy a BMW. I drove that BMW over a rock once. It was dark and in a rocky place, so don't ask. And it nearly wrecked the car. It was a sign to give up, but I didn't. A year later, a bus sideswiped that car and wrecked it again. But I used insurance money to buy a better car. Why? Because that's what you do when you're middle class, boring and affluent. If you want to escape that world, you have to change the people you hang around with. See my point later about mentors and your peer group. But back to the car. Not only was that BMW losing value every day, the loan was increasing in size because of interest. That's the trap they want us to fall into. Most people end up working four to six months of their year to buy a car to drive to work in. Why? So they can afford to buy a car to drive to work in. That's fucked up. 
Financial freedom means making money while you sleep. This is passive income. Let's say you go travel the world for six months. How will your finances look at the end of it? A lot of people who talk about backpacking around the world aren't financially free. They're working online or living in cheap countries so they can afford the bills. It's a step in the right direction, but it's not freedom. When you're surrounded by a lot of other people earning, say, 500 bucks a month, you think 500 bucks is okay, but it can also be a trap. Living on coconut dollars may be fun for a couple of years, but then what? What happens when you get bored of Southeast Asia? Paying off the mortgage isn't financial freedom. It's a phony middle-class dream that keeps people tied to their boring salary jobs for 40 years. Only when they hit 55, the kids have fled the nest, their salaries are high enough and they've made 25 years of mortgage repayments, can they start enjoying a loan-free life if they're lucky. Don't buy into the BS about paying off your mortgage. Why wait until you're 55? That made sense for your parents' generation, but today understand that freedom comes from taking and using risk, not removing it from your life. Increase good debt, reduce bad debt. If you can take small steps every day in this direction, you too can become financially free. Okay, so let's talk about the plan, the escape plan. This is how you can achieve financial and creative freedom. It's how I achieved it. It worked for me. It could also work for you. So there are three elements to this escape plan, which is one, do work which makes a difference, which you feel that you're making a contribution and making a change in the world and you're here for a purpose. Two, grow your wealth. So wealth really means having the financial capability to do what you want. And thirdly, owning your time. So let's have a look at those again. Do work that makes a difference. Grow your wealth and own your time. Those are the three elements, those are the three benefits of the escape plan. If you effect this plan properly, you can achieve all of those three things. The goal of the escape plan isn't to lie on the beach all day. Trust me, you know, as much as that sounds a great idea, after a while, it kind of gets a little bit boring, boring, especially if you're an entrepreneur like me. You lie on the beach and you, your mind's really active. I think one of the, the curses and blessings of the entrepreneur is our mind is active all the time. We're going at a thousand kilometers an hour. And you're lying on a beach and you're thinking about, well, what else can I do? What can I build? What can I create? And that's kind of the mind of the entrepreneur in a way. It's always on. There's no off switch. So lying on a beach is fun up to a point, and I've done that. I did that for three years, more or less. But after a while, you kind of feel you need to do something. You need to make that work that makes a difference. You need to make a contribution. You need to create something. You need to build something. So lying on the beach isn't the goal of the escape plan. That's an option. As I said before, this is about choice. So let's talk about examples of what choice can do for you. The first one is you can take time out. You can take a month out or take three years out like I did. You can go and join that hippie ashram in India if you really want to, or you can go and train in the Sahara for the Marathon des Sables race, or you can just sip tea in your back garden and hang out in a place like this in Bali in paradise. Cheers. Think about what you want to do next. Secondly, you can scale back a little bit. Perhaps, you know, you'd like to get into a new project. Perhaps you are not feeling it for the current project that you're involved in. Maybe you're a little bit stuck, but, you know, having choice gives you the ability to move between what you really love doing and not getting stuck into something just because it pays the bills. And thirdly, you can find some kind of balance. I know people talk about work-life work balance. I don't really believe in work-life balance. I believe, you know, if work is something you're really passionate about, then, you know, why do you want to stop doing it? But the problem is, is that most people may be passionate about the goal, but not the actual work itself. You know, they may be doing 100 hours of quite strenuous hard work. Um, they're passionate about what they're trying to do, which is build something or achieve something. But the hard work itself is probably the least enjoyable part of it. And as you get older, 
you know, I think that you understand that what time is really worth. You know, you have less time and more money and you realize that money can't buy time. So you want more time. How can you do that when you're working, you know, crazy hours? So having choice means being able to exercise that ability to scale things back a little bit and find some kind of balance in your life. You know, the escape plan isn't a get rich scheme or some kind of, you know, quick fix. I don't believe in quick fixes. You know, there is a book called The Secret, which teaches you that if you can just kind of visualize and imagine that your destiny and your, you know, your future world and all your goals, it will come to you. It's the magic that's been talked down by, you know, many, many centuries from many, many years ago. To me, that's complete bullshit. You know, I believe that if you are going to achieve financial and creative freedom, you have to work hard and you have to work hard internally as well. And this is about not just building a business, but, you know, changing yourself internally as well. You know, that internal work that looks at your habits, your mindset and so on. That's really important. As much as the nuts and bolts of building a business, you need to be the right kind of person that can build that business in the first place. But the good news is you can change all of that. You can work on yourself. You can work on your business. But I have to say, one thing you have to know is that this takes time. It takes a long time to become financially and creatively free. People want that silver bullet. And this just isn't that. You know, it took me 10 years to get there. It took me 10 years to achieve financial and creative freedom. The good news is it may be a lot less for you because now I have the formula. I can teach you that formula. You can follow that formula, implement it, and avoid all the mistakes and the time wasting that I made during those 10 years. So you can accelerate up that learning curve a lot faster than it took for me. So that's the good news, but it does take time. You know, the actual length is probably less relevant than the fact that you know it does take time. So some people might say, well, 10 years is too long. I can't wait that long to become financially free. Well, you're going to get old anyway. So get over that. So you might as well do it and do it doing something that you really love, which could be building a business. There's an old Chinese proverb that I want to share with you, which is this. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is to ignore the real world. So you've got an idea and one of the things you're going to encounter is people say stuff like, oh, that would never work in the real world or, you know, that kind of stuff, that kind of negativity that you get from people who aren't entrepreneurs. It's really important that you ignore the real world because the real world hasn't produced the idea that you're trying to develop already. So, you know, up to now it doesn't work, right? And the real world can be a bit of a depressing place to live in, you know. Often people react negatively when presented with a new idea. Real world inhabitants are pessimistic and fearful and they expect failure. If you want to be successful, you've got to ignore the real world. And the real world can be groups of people who are around you, who want to drag you back to their level. Or they could be newspapers or TV. You need to turn that stuff off, right? You've got to make two key decisions in developing your idea. One decide what you're going to pay attention to, listen to, turn off the rest. Two, decide who you're going to hang around with and say goodbye to the rest. These are tough decisions, but often this is the hardest part of entrepreneurship. And that's why some people can't get ahead. That's why some people can't develop ideas because they pay attention to the wrong sources and their brain gets full up with the daily crap of stuff. You know, you've only got to read the newspapers to see how fearful it is, right? That stuff doesn't help you develop ideas. And secondly, they hang around people that put their ideas down or negate their ideas or say, mm, yes, but. So you've got to find the right people to hang around with. You know, go to the meetups, change your social network, find a mentor, find a group of peers that you can hang around with that are going to support your ideas. It's either hell yeah or nothing. Derek Sivers from CD Baby asked this question. Does it make my heart beat faster? And I love this question about anything in business, whether it's choosing a new project, seeking clients, marketing, or importantly, your idea. Ask yourself this question. Does it make my heart beat faster? Honestly, if you can answer this question, 
if you can apply it to everything that you do, you're going to get massively different results. Think about this. Use this rule when you're overcommitted or your energy is spread over too many projects. If you're not saying hell yeah, hell yeah about something, say no. We're making a decision. Ask, does this make my heart beat faster? So start writing those ideas down. When you write that idea down, does it get you thinking? Does it get you sweating? Does it get your pulse racing? If not, say no. You can apply this rule to ideas, business opportunities, partnerships, events, meetings. Think about that. How much time we waste on stuff which doesn't really get our heart thumping. The problem is that we say yes to too much. And it's especially true of ideas. We're keen to seek out every opportunity. We're scared of missing out. Maybe we're scared of saying no to people. But we inevitably end up hurting ourselves. When you say no more, you leave a little room in your life to throw yourself into the things you can really say hell yeah to. So when thinking about your idea, ask yourself honestly, can I say hell yeah to? We hear a lot about how motivation is important for success. This theme comes up in a later myth too. Perhaps you're not feeling inspired or motivated. Hard to get the job done, isn't it? Well, it may interest you to know that success is less about motivation and more about getting the job done. There's a thought-provoking opinion piece called Motivation is for Amateurs that got me thinking. The author points to the success of many creative types, from artists to designers, who were able to get the job done, motivation or not. For example, author Stephen King woke up every day and typed out 1,000 words, whether he was feeling inspired, motivated or not. That ability to get the job done made him the world's most successful writer. It had little to do with motivation. Once you look under the hood of success, you'll see that it's about habits, not motivation. Successful people aren't more motivated. They have better habits. So what could that mean to you? Well, Do you have a time and a place that you can power out your creative work or are you beset by distraction? You might be super motivated, but motivation is never sustainable. Motivation is an energy that ebbs and flows. Some days you're just not feeling it. It's those days where someone who relies on motivation lags, but the guy with the good habits gets the job done. Rather than focus on staying motivated, go to work on your habits, particularly those at the start of your day. Where is the time and place when you are most productive? That's where you'll get your best work done. It's simple 80-20 dynamics. I bet there's a two-hour period of your day that produces 80% of your results. The rest is fluff. I get on my bike and cycle to Starbucks at 9 a.m., I work through to 11.30 a.m. without distraction. In those two and a half hours, I can achieve all my daily productivity goals. Once you know the answer to this question, build your daily routine around this time and place. Make it sacred. Don't waste that time on emails, pointless meetings or social media. Motivation comes and goes, but your core productive time should become a fixture of your schedule. The most motivating thing you can do is to give yourself the time and place to get the job done. Today's message, what I want to share with you today in achieving your goals, whether that's personal, financial, business, fitness, whatever, the most important aspect in achieving your goals is not hard work it's not motivation it's not inspiration it's surrounding yourself with good people and if you look at successful people you will find a key component of their success has been surrounding themselves with good people now take my iron friend mr 72 year old iron man wants to be professional friend As an example, if you knew somebody like that, what would happen if you said to yourself, in that sort of self-talk, which really, you know, it impacts us when we're lying in bed at night or we're just sort of having a quiet moment thinking, whatever. If you said to yourself, I'm too old 
to do an Ironman, right? What would you say if you knew that guy? Well, for first of all, I'm 44. I'm nearly 45, right? I'm 45 this year. He's This guy is 25 to 30 years older than me. That's like me talking to somebody who was in their teens, right? You know, my point is, is that what we think of in terms of possibilities, acceptable behavior, normal behavior, is really defined by the people around us not necessarily by our own internal compass, right? We adapt and adjust to the people around us. So if you were surrounded by people like him, the idea of competing an Ironman at any age becomes normal and acceptable. Think about how powerful that is, both in terms of motivating you and also opening your world to possibilities. Now, the reason I say this is because think of the opposite of that situation. Now flip that situation on its head and you're not surrounded by Mr. 72-year-old Iron Man. You're surrounded by people who have a different outlook on life, which is more negative. So, you know, they will say, you know, you can't train at an Iron Man in your age, or, you know, I'm too old to, act, you know, to exercise, or I'm too old to X, Y, and Z. Whatever it is, I'm too X to Y. That's the excuse that people come out with. If you're surrounded by those people, they may not say to you directly, no, you can't do something. Like, you can't do an Ironman. You can't run a marathon. You can't start a business. You can't, whatever it is that you want to do, you can't go and travel the world for three years, right? They won't say that to you directly, but by observing and absorbing their behavior, you too become more like them. Because the last thing we want to do as human beings, as social beings, is we want to be rejected by our peers. So we subconsciously shape our expectations and goals based on the expectations and goals of people around us. Think about how powerful that is. So there's an author called Jim Rohn, and he said that, you know, we are the sum of the five people we hang around with on a regular basis. So imagine if you hung around with 72-year-old Iron Man guy or people like that, you too would become more motivated. However, if you hang around with the opposite of that, you too will become more demotivated, whether you want to or not. Again, it's the social being. We subconsciously adjust ourselves so we don't become rejected. We don't become an outlier in our own group. So... The people you hang around with will change how you feel about yourself and you think what's possible, what's acceptable, and what's normal. So, you know, if you want to be successful, hang around with successful people. It's as simple as that. If you want to be a failure, hang around with people who have a negative outlook in life. I'll give you an example. I wanted to travel the world with my family and people didn't outright reject me or say no but their values and the kind of things that they said indirectly really impacted how I thought about that adventure. So for example, people would say, oh, you know, are you sure? Do you want to give up your career? What about your family? What about your, you know, you know, your education of your son? All these kind of things, which are all done in, you know, out of their heart and out of their best interest. But what it's doing is this, you know, it's this constant battle between fear and freedom on a daily basis. So fear, and I talked about this yesterday in the video, fear in the sense that, you know, pushing you towards the comfort zone, back into your cage, if you like, and freedom, you know, allowing you to step outside your comfort zone, and that's really where life starts, and that's where you're gonna make mistakes and grow as an individual. But it really depends on the people that you hang around with, because they will sow seeds in your mind, so they will say things which may eventually get to you or they will water the seeds that have already been planted in your mind. Like, for example, if you're thinking about starting a business, you may get the, the conversation, oh, like you're too X to Y, right? You're too old to start a business. You're too young to start a business. You're too inexperienced. You don't have enough capital. You're too female. You're too married. You're too apparent to start a business. All these kind of excuses. You know, it's not a good time to start a business. 
And here's the interesting thing. This is the sort of the progression that we experience as entrepreneurs, which I want to share with you. And it's the same with training, right? <coughs> Excuse me. You start out with this big goal. I want to do X, okay? And what happens is, is that first period, you're really motivated and molded up and you, you want to do X, right? And you're Superman, Superwoman. You're just plowing through every obstacle that, you know, life and people throw at you, right? But what happens is, is that enthusiasm gets you through all those kind of negative criticisms, those negative responses that people may throw at you. But after a few weeks, after a few months, what happens is that enthusiasm wears out. So, you know, you've gone from a situation where you're completely motivated to now where you're hitting the wall. Now you're starting to feel, actually, this is harder than I thought. Or, you know, if you're starting a business and you're a few weeks in and you haven't made any sales, you start to have that kind of doubt. At the beginning, you don't care because you're just so motivated. But four or five weeks in, you're starting to doubt yourself. You know, this is hard. This is a lot harder than I thought. Maybe, you know, I set myself a goal that was too big or whatever. And that's the dip that author Seth Godin talks about. It's a, we start off hugely motivated and then we dip down, right? <clears throat> and it's that dip that makes us, right? Because it's at that point where we, you know, we're most likely to fail. You know, it's it's like in a marathon, as Seth Godin says, nobody gives up the marathon in the last mile, do they? Most people quit the marathon halfway through and it's like that with any goal or endeavor that we take on. You know, because we can't see the beginning, we can't see the end, we're in the middle part. And that's where our motivation is lowest. And here's the interesting thing. And that's why it comes back to surrounding yourself with good people. Because at that point, what those people say will have a huge impact on how we progress. You know, will those people talk to us and say things like, well, maybe now isn't a good time to start a business. Or, well, maybe you should have had more money before you started. Or, you know, maybe you've had your little adventure now. Now you can go back to normality. Those sort of doubts will get to you at that point. At the beginning, the first four or five weeks, that period of enthusiasm, you know, you're so strong, you don't listen to those doubts. But when you're weak, when you're going through that dip period, that's where the doubts will get to you because that's where your resistance, your strength and your courage is at its lowest point. And what happens then is, you know, people give up. You know, they, they give up, they break. It's like running a marathon and people shouting from the sideline rather than shouting, come on, come on, come on, come on, which is what you want. Those people are shouting, hey, you look really bad or maybe you should have a, a sit down or maybe you should just take a break or maybe you don't look like you're going to finish this. That's kind of what people are saying, right? They're not saying it outright directly, but they're giving you those sort of small doubts which sort of plant seeds in your head. So it's so important to surround yourself with good people. In my example about traveling the world for three years, imagine if you said that to somebody, I want to go and quit my job and I want to go and fulfill a life dream of going and travel the world. And people say, yeah, well, maybe, you know, it's not such a good idea, but, you know, you want to go and do it, go and do it. So you go out and travel and you go to Africa or wherever it is that you start off, somewhere challenging. You go there and after a few months, for whatever reason, you have to quit. Or you have to come back home. So you go back home and those people are there waiting and they didn't necessarily outright stop you before you decided to go on this little adventure. But what they say is, I told you so. You know, and that's the power of doubt. And that's the power of having negative people around you. And, you know, often these are people that we can't choose in our life. They could be family, they could be friends. But the point being is that, you know, they have a profound impact on how we go through life and try to achieve our goals. Whereas if they're the kind of people that sort of say, you know, if you come back after three or four months from your travel, uh, they don't say, I told you say that they say, hey, well, well, maybe you can regroup and do it again. Or maybe you can go and do it next year. Or maybe you can just take a break and then pick it up again from where you left. Okay, so let's round up some tips, some hacks for you to consider in terms of Surrounding yourself with good people, how do you do it? Well, first things first, here's a great philosophy which I have had to learn the hard way and I'm trying to live by is don't sell to the unsold. So 
If you're an entrepreneur, you only have so much energy. You're not a robot, you're a human being. You have a finite amount of energy. Save your energy for those people who count. Don't try to convert the people who are unsold on your ideas or your goals. And that's a big mistake that entrepreneurs, change agents, people of action, ambition, sports people, whatever, people who wanna do shit in their lives, that's a big mistake that people make is what they do is they use all that energy and fire all their photons and tachyons and you know all their calories at these people trying to convert them trying to get them to think in the same way that you think so if you've got an idea let's say you want to start a business and these people are saying no you know you are throwing all your energy at these people to try and get them to think like you and to accept that this is a good idea because you really want them to say yes it's a good idea but they're just saying no 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 don't do it or whatever it is that your goal is they're against the idea don't waste your energy on these people if these people are friends and family my advice to you is simply don't talk to them about your goals simple as that just keep quiet instead share your energy with those people who won't suck energy out of you who will multiply your energy. What you wanna be doing, you know, when you surround yourself with good people is when you share these goals, is when those people start getting excited and start asking you questions, say where, when, why, how, whatever it is, you know, they're now getting you fired up. Those are the people that you wanna share your goals with, not the people who are gonna say yes, but, and doubt what you have to offer. So the first things first is don't sell to the unsold. You know, there's a Rumi quote from the poet Rumi, which I love, which basically goes like this. Set your life on fire. Seek those who fan your flames. So the second thing is surrounding yourself with good people. Find yourself a mastermind. Find yourself a group of people that you can hang around with on a regular basis for the pure sole purpose of helping each other grow personally and professionally. So I do this twice a week. I have two groups and these uh, these mastermind members are all over the world. I've got people in the UK and in Indonesia and in Japan, everywhere in Spain. So we meet together once a week via Skype and we share our business objectives and goals. And throughout that hour, we help each other grow our businesses. So we have a challenge, we share that challenge with the other people. And rather than say, oh, you know, you shouldn't do that, or that's a bad idea, they help each other. You know, we are there to help each other, help each other grow our business. And that's the power of a mastermind. It's not my idea. Napoleon Hill, you probably heard of him, was the, you know, one of the first founders of the idea of the mastermind. And it works. I'll talk a bit about masterminds in a future episode but for now just think about it if you're not a member of a mastermind think about forming one if you can't find one you know reach out find two or three people that you could meet with you know go to starbucks once a month at a set time set day and you know with the specific objective of helping each other share business problems and grow as entrepreneurs so the mastermind's one. Secondly, go to events, go to meetup events, find meetups in your local area, specifically aimed at people like you. So if you're an entrepreneur, go to startup events, go to entrepreneur events, go to business events, go and meet people, find those people who are gonna set your life on fire. And you know, forget about handing out all those business cards. Don't do the business card thing, right? Rather than do the business card thing, just find you know every event, one or two people, and focus on them that you think are those people that can really multiply your efforts and your energies. And those are the people that you would like to meet, you know, have a coffee with once a month, whatever. No agenda apart from let's help each other grow our businesses. What do you do? I face this question a lot. Networking events, friends, family, then there's immigration officials. It would be easier to answer this question if I was a software engineer or a teacher. Everybody knows what a software engineer or a teacher does. Just fill software engineer in the box, stamp your visa card and be on your way. That's another story you tell yourself, your job. If you keep telling people you're a software engineer, what happens when you lose your job? You lose your identity too. That's like a 
social death. It's so scary. We'll do everything possible not to make it happen. So we'll work crazy hours, suck up to the boss and go with the flow because I am a software engineer. Mine, however, is a long story. But then that's the price you pay when you choose to do different. You could live a much more interesting life, but you have to face the furrowed brows when you answer the question, what exactly do you do? I have trouble explaining this to my dear mother sometimes. Immigration officials, well, that's another league of suspicion altogether. They don't like my approach. I tried it once at the US-Canadian border. The official looked at me like I was on drugs because he wanted a one-word answer rather than a story. So, you travel a lot, visit companies, invest in these companies, eh? Like a manager. Look, it makes my and your life easier if I just write manager in the box here. I nodded. Sometimes you have to know when to just smile and tell people what they want to hear. Manager? But I don't report to anyone. I don't manage anything or anybody. I outsource all my management to dedicated managers, but nobody turns up at my desk every morning and asks, what would you like me to do today? Honestly, what do I do? Well, I travel, explore and write. I'm an adventurer at heart. That is what I do. But can you write adventurer on the immigration card? What about a business card? Sounds a bit cranky. Manager is a lot safer. I make my money in real estate, so I could also be a real estate investor. I invest elsewhere too, including precious metals and other businesses. I write books, I run a radio show, two radio shows in fact, and a venture business for mobile entrepreneurs. I swim, bike and run a lot. I completed an Ironman once, but I'm not a manager. That's not my real story, easy as it is. I don't have a normal life or a normal job with a normal title. I don't commute to a normal office, take a normal salary or write email memos copied into 20 normal people. Life is easier when you fit in the box, but is easier ever better? Next time someone asks, what do you do? Play with them a little. Throw them a curveball. Rather than nodding their heads, get them to say, seriously? That's a great conversation starter. If they get it, they'll want to know more, ask questions. You'll soon learn who you should invest your energies in and who is a waste of your time. The time wasters are the ones who scratch their heads with suspicion. You don't fit into their box. Life's absurd. It's a game. Play it by your own rules.